Open the pod bay doors, please, Hal. I saw one just like it in Waco. Hey, Pike, you know what I hear? I hear they take over those things up north that can fly. No, oh, that was a balloon, you damned old fool. No, the old man's right. They got motors, wings, go 60 miles in less than an hour. Driven to the border by the irresistible thrust of civilization were the remnants of the breed that had made the West wild. If they move, kill them. The payrolls were harder to get at. <laughs> The army rode the railroad now. But there were still a few trails for the kind who'd be cold before they were tame. They called them the Wild Bunch. Pike had been a gentleman of principle. He still had a principle or two. We're not getting rid of anybody. We're gonna stick together just like it used to be. When you side with a man, you stay with him. And if you can't do that, you're like some animal. You're finished. Dutch had dug for gold. He gave up digging. How many cases did you take from the train? 16 cases of rifles. We lost one on the trail. He stole it. Look at him. Thornton should have been a lawyer. He always argued. Oh! Relax, it's just some champagne we ordered. Sykes had been a gunman in his day. He still had the gun. We, we, we gotta get him back! How? Gorch had been trying for years. Sometimes he almost worked up to normal. I want you to meet my fiance. Bay doors are open. I am your host, Doug Heller, film critic and film historian for TalkMovieToMe.com and co-host of the Cave of Wonders podcast as well, with my intrepid co-host, Jerry Dean Roberts, uh, film critic at ArmchairCinema.com, ArmchairOscars.com, and uh, co-host on the Cave of Wonders with me as well. Hello, Jerry. Hello. Don't listen to him. I gave his word to a railroad. <laughs> Today, we are talking about my absolute favorite Western, Sam Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch, starring William Holden, Ernest Borgnine, Robert Ryan, Edmund O'Brien, Warren Oates, Jaime Sanchez, and Ben Johnson. Uh, Everybody's in this movie. Everybody. <laughs> and, and I don't think I've ever seen... I mean, William Holden has given some comparable performances to this, but I even, as much as I love Marty, I think this is Borgnine's best performance and his last great performance. It is. Um, Robert Ryan is spectacular in it. Edmund O'Brien is wonderful in it. I mean... Strother Martin, uh, Warren Oates. Even Alfonso oh, Rao is man. in this. Yeah. And uh, this movie, uh, it came out in 1969. Um, amid a flurry of controversy because of how violent it was. It pushed the boundaries for uh, post-code, early fledgling MPAA rating uh, violence and language. Um, and nudity. And nudity, yes. There is, there is a bit of that in there, too. And uh, it's, it's the story of... Uh, 
just aging outlaws who have been at it for a long time. It's 1913. Things are, are changing. And uh, they wanted to do one last score. And Pike, the William Holden character, says, we got to start thinking beyond our guns. I love that line. I so love that oh. line. And then he dies with his hand on the tri- on a, on the handle of a, a of the gun. Yeah. I mean, it was just yeah. There's so many so many good lines in this. And this, like I said, I've been watching this movie. I I discovered this movie back in the '90s when the American Film Institute put out that uh, uh, hundred years, a hundred movies. In '98, I was 17 years old. And I was just getting into film history, and I used that list as a primer. And and I saw this movie then, and I used to watch it all the time. And I still go back to it every several years and rewatch it. But you, Jerry, this was your first time. I'd never seen it. Um, this is one of those movies that's been floating around. Um, it, it's just sort of been... Not that I didn't want to see it. It's just I never made time for it. Um, I mm-hmm. I'll be honest with you. I'm I've never been partial to westerns. Um, this one, not particularly for that reason. It's just a movie I never got around to it. Um, I have a small list of films that I've never just haven't ha- haven't made the time to sit down and watch. Because you and I are critics. We see so many movies mm-hmm. all the time. Yes. I mean, we watch so much stuff. And we're mostly stuck in the present. Right. Unless it is a movie that we are discussing for this show. Mm-hmm. And um, the, the thing is, it's, it's always great to discover a movie like this. <laughs> and what's interesting is, I thought it was just another Western. Ah. And what's amazing is, I thought it was just... You know, like John Wayne or something like that. No, it is not mm-hmm. anything like that. John Wayne hated this movie. No, John yes, Wayne. Yes, he did. He did. He hated this movie because he said it was mm-hmm. contributing to to demystifying the West. Right. And he right. he and he hated demystify it. it does. And demystifying the movies he was making. Now, also, the, let's let's yeah. put this movie in its context. This was 1969. Um, there were two other westerns this particular year that were competing. Um, yeah. and both of them were very, and the other two were very Hollywood. One was True Grit, yes, which won John Wayne his Oscar, mm-hmm. and the other was Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Mm-hmm. Both of those films were traditional. Yes, this one was not, and for reasons we're going to talk about. And it was also kind of a year when the uh, the. Hollywood was really fighting for space yes. between what was traditional and what was the new Hollywood. Right. Um, you look at the best picture when you look at the best picture nominees that year. Um, you had um, Hello Dolly competing with mm-hmm. Midnight Cowboy. <laughs> you know, I mean, it was just it was kind of that that weird kind of traditional versus the new because the world was changing. They were both kind of matchmakers in a way, yeah. I suppose. These were violent times. <laughs> this was the 60s. These were extremely violent times. And yes. this movie perpetuated. And this movie really kind of showed that. And also mm-hmm. a movie, you know, something different like Easy Rider. You know? Yeah. And uh, it, 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 they were what the youth wanted. Because you have to remember, at the time, most movies were about older people a lot of movies were about older people older stars that young people didn't care anything about Mm -hmm. and this movie was a mixture of older stars with a new texture because this is not this is not john wayne this is not john ford no this is not any of that sam peckinpah the director had a way of taking these kinds of films and ripping the veneer off Yes. And making them more brutal, more realistic. Um, he had a way of taking a genre piece and just turning it on its head. He did the same thing a couple of years later with a movie called Convoy, which mm-hmm. was which came out right in the middle of all of those Hal Needham, Burt Reynolds car chase movies. And that one was serious, 
because it was basically the same kind of trucker mentality, the same kind of road trip mentality without the comedy. Di- right. Doing it realistically. And he mm-hmm. does the same thing here. Um, again, this is a violent movie. And yes. how do we describe the plot outside of... Well, generally, it's... Uh... The William Holden character, Pike, is a notorious outlaw who had bumped off uh, a railroad company several times in the past to the point where they are just hunting him viciously, using one of his old compatriots, uh, Deke Thornton, played by Robert Ryan, to track him. Uh... They set up a fake heist. Uh, they set up a, 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 a fake, uh, well, a, a fake payroll to lure the bunch into a town where they ambush them. And this drives them south into Mexico, where they agree to work for uh, one of the competing generales in uh, in Mexico, uh, Mapache, who is fighting Pancho Villa. And uh, they agree to steal some guns for him off of a military transport, Mm -hmm. uh, an American military transport. And uh, that's basically, I mean, after after that, uh, it's how they deliver the guns. Um, One of the subplots, though, is uh, Jaime Sanchez, uh, Angel. Uh, they, They go back to his town. And they find out that Mapache has been through there, stole their crops, and uh, his his girlfriend went off with them willingly. Mm. And when he sees her again, he shoots her. Yeah. And they think that he's trying to shoot the general. Uh, Pike convinces Mapache to let Angel come on the uh, the, the gun heist with them, and uh, once it's over. They uh, they take him hostage, and it takes some soul searching from Pike and uh, the other the other members of the bunch, which is Dutch, which is Ernest Borgnine, uh, Warren Oates plays Lyle Gorch, and Ben Johnson plays his brother Tector Gorch, and Edmund O'Brien plays Fred Freddie. Freddie Sykes, Freddy Sykes yeah. yeah he's he's out in he he's not with them at this point because he he gets uh run off and shot Mm. not killed uh he gets saved but he's not with them at this point they go back into the town to hide from deke thornton and his and his group and uh pike decides to go go get angel and that leads to uh, the most iconic part in in the movie, which is their walk through town. Yeah. They arm themselves, they walk through town, completely improvised scene, on the day, not written out. Uh, in the documentary uh, that often accompanies the movie, it was an Oscar-nominated movie, uh, documentary from 1996 called the wild bunch an album in montage uh peckinpah says that uh they slapped a long lens on the camera and they kept having the the assistant director and stuff put people in their way as they were walking up the whole thing was completely just made up on the spot completely ad-libbed while they were shooting it yeah and when they get up mapache says what do you want we want angel in mm. William Holden's spectacular style. Yeah. And he kills him. They shoot up Mapache. They look at each other and they're like, yeah, let's go for it. And they just start this massive gun fight. It's a massacre. It's ugly. What? It's like, it so, just goes on and it's, it, it is, it is brutal. It's ugly. There's actual it's blood. Incredible. There's, I mean, they, yeah. You, you see blood shooting out from the wounds. Which you'd never uh, seen before. No, 
No. And Peck and Paw. Zack Snyder needs to watch Peck and Paw, specifically this, so that he understands how to artfully use slow motion. Yeah. Because he just throws it in anywhere. Peck and Paw uses it even in non dramatic moments when the horses are coming down that sand dune. Mm-hmm. Slow motion. And the horses are falling over. And the horses are getting yeah. shot. And there's a lot of. You, you know, you always see these westerns that. Um, you always see these westerns where nothing happens to the horse. The guy gets shot off the horse, but nothing ever happens right. to the horse. They, they, the horses get right. killed. They fall down. They, yeah. they get shot. Uh huh. And it kind mm-hmm. of plays to the reality, you know, and it. Um, it flips it on its head. Now, I'll say this about this movie. I don't have the history with it that you do. Um, my history with right. it goes back about 24 hours. I'm just <laughs> seeing the movie for the first time. And what I my observation, these people are scumbags. Yeah. And But they're also extremely desperate. And mm-hmm. they're trying to hold on to a measure of humanity that is slipping away from them with the times. Mm-hmm. And with what is happening and what is happening in the world around them. Um, And to a point, they're trying to hold on to a code. Yeah, yeah. Uh, You know, honor among thieves kind of a kind of a thing where you 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 stick with the your crew. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's it's uh, you know, it's a loyalty thing. And uh, it's yeah, they're they're terrible people. I mean, there's really no way around that. They steal, they whore, they shoot, you know, they, they kill people. They, they they don't care. They're out for money to, to get themselves to a point where they cannot have to do this anymore. Mm-hmm. Or at least so they say. And when it comes down to it, when the movie's over, when it's all said and done, and the, all the bloodshed and all of the the death and murder and all of that, what is it really worth? You know, and it, it, you look back on it mm-hmm. and you ask yourself, what is money really worth? Because um, all of this was so that these guys could have some money, could have this silver that they wanted to be able to retire from this lifestyle that they've created for themselves. And when you get right. down to the end, it's really not worth anything. It's it's as worthless. Now, there's a scene early in the film when they discover that they've been duped. Um, they open the, the, the little trunk, the cachet, and they realize it's a bunch of steel washers. Mm-hmm. And they realize it's the gold, the silver that they were supposed to get is... They've been screwed, basically, yeah. out of their loot. They were set up. They were set up. And... Mm-hmm. You know, all this blood and death for nothing. And yeah. it's because the, the opening scene actually is um, just as mm. brutal. It is because there's this ambush and um, they didn't tell the townsfolk. And so there's this big temperance rally, mm-hmm. this parade going through the street when pike and the gang are are doing their their robbery they're on one side of the street in the bank and robert ryan's group is on the other side staking on a rooftop so that they can shoot them when they come out right but pike sees the the temperance thing going down the street and he goes we'll join them we'll get right in with them Mm -hmm. figuring that they wouldn't then open fire on the townsfolk right well they were wrong (laughs) and the audience probably didn't think that either yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so the 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 bunch lost I think about 3 3 or 4 people in that opening shootout. Right. Well, here's and... here, here's what I drew from it. Here's what I'm sorry. Here's what I drew from it. <laughs> um I did not know and I had I'm I'm actually I actually asked you while I was watching it, when does this movie take place? And I was surprised when you came back and you said around 1917, because when you watch the the opening of this film, you think it takes place just after the Civil War. Right, you're thinking yeah. it's the Old West, you know, because this mm-hmm. town looks like the Old West, and you're you're looking mm-hmm. at it. There's a temperance rally going through. Everyone is dressed mm-hmm. like like a Western. And then you find out, and then these guys come in and they're dressed in military uniforms. 
You're thinking, okay, well, was this the reserve? No, these are American salt military men, and or dressed mm-hmm. like American military men, and they look like they're ready for World War One. Turns out it's mm-hmm. 1913, and you're as as the movie progresses. All I can think, because I've studied so much about World War One, is that this is the beginning of a dangerous new world. This mm-hmm. is the end. That they they are. I guess you'd say late to the party as far as this kind of old <laughs> west me- mentality this old west code. Yeah. And when you mm-hmm. get the world at this time this 1913 was becoming more dangerous. It's becoming mechanized. Um there's mm-hmm. a scene late in the film when <laughs> these Mexicans get a hold of a machine gun and it goes <laughs> off and they don't know how to get it stopped. Well, because it's not, it's supposed to be mounted on a tripod, and there's, there's, there's a couple of German officers with Mapache, and the guy keeps yelling at him, it has to be on the tripod, it must be mounted on the tripod, and they're not listening to him, and they just get it loaded, and two of them are holding it, and Mapache's got the trigger, and it's just brrrr, everywhere, going all over the place, and, and it's, it's not funny because people are diving for safety, but it is funny at the same time. And then the real comedy comes when he finally gets it to stop. Mm-hmm. And it goes off again. And then he looks off, and then he goes back, and he he consciously pulls the trigger to do it again. <laughs> like... <laughs> but see, these were the new weapons of the time. And they were, mm-hmm. they, people didn't understand how they worked, and they took them into the war, and they were brutal, and they were just, they were just mowing people down. And mm-hmm. that scene is played for laughs, but at the same time, you're also thinking, these are dangerous new weapons. Right, and, and it the, sets up the end. First thing, they know. don't know the first thing about them. Right, and it sets up the end, and they even talk about, there's a, there's a car that comes in, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. That's what I was just gonna say. Uh, Mapache, Mapache has a car, and and the bunch are looking at it. And um, Ernest Borgnine says, "What the hell is says, that?" Ernest Borgnine, yeah, what the hell is that? And he said, "I've I've seen I I heard tell that up north they've got one with with wings that can fly." And he goes, "Now nah, you're you're talking about a balloon." And he goes, and Pike is like, "No, no, he's right. They're gonna they're gonna put bombs in it and use it in the war." They say, mm-hmm. "Yeah." What's interesting to me, though, so, is how they missed this. Because the car has yeah. been around, from their point of view, from, from where they're sitting, the car has been around for a decade, generally. Yeah, and yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. So is the airplane. Um, but mm-hmm. they've been living like cowboys out on the plains, mm-hmm. out in the west, and right. they've never seen this kind of stuff. Right. We generally... And th- if you really th- think about the ages of, of the people involved, Holden... And Pike and and Ryan uh, were probably what in their mid sixties. That's yeah, fifties or sixties, yeah. You know, so if you go back from nineteen thirteen, they were young men in the old west, right? Right. So this is just what they've been doing, and and the the Gorge brothers, and and Duke, they've just been. They've been down there, and they've just been living this old life that they are now confronted with the fact that it's evaporating. It's evaporating in time, ta- in um, in ways that are not are also social because at the same time, mm-hmm. the younger people have no code. You right. want something, you have a gun, you shoot somebody, you take what you want. Yep. There's no mm-hmm. honor, there's no code, there's no humanity to it. It's the same thing as the film that I'm I'm going to want to talk I'm I'm going to, we're going to talk about in a couple of episodes, The Godfather, which is the tipping of the times because you 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 move to much more violent, less um considerate times. Mm-hmm. People don't think about anything. They think about what they want and they take it. Mm-hmm. That's what this movie is about. Um, exactly. They they don't um you rob a train, you don't hold the conductor at 
gunpoint, you shoot the conductor, and you take the gold, and you go. That's right. that's that's the times they're living in, and that's the times. And mm-hmm. you realize that as you look at guys like the William Holden character, the Ernest Borgnine character, Edmund O'Brien, you realize the time has passed them by. Yeah, and they don't even realize it. Right, because when they rob the train, they don't kill any of the workers. Right. They've got the conductor, they've got the engineer, and they um, they hold them at gunpoint and have them operate a little bit of the train. And then uh, they have them get off. Mm-hmm. They don't. They don't kill them. They they are just doing their job. But you've got. But you've got people like you got people like, um, like Freddie's grandson, and you've got people like the Warren Oates character who are yep. younger and they want to kill. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a scene I can't remember the character's name, but he's uh, he, he turns out to be Freddie's grandson. And at the beginning, he's he's sexually molesting an older woman and yeah. it's like the code that pike and dutch would have held for themselves that wouldn't have even been in the picture right and it's it's just this this strange kind of connectivity between one generation and the next um mm-hmm. it's not just being young and impulsive it's having a, co- a complete um, completely disavowing any kind of ethics at all, yeah. even though you're yeah. robbing people. And um, it's more brutal than I thought it was. I knew it was violent. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize that it was this deep, to be honest. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a very thoughtful and thought-provoking film. Uh, uh, much more so than you would expect from anything that is that is really really violent, and more so than you would really consider from a western. This this picture, for me, does all of the things that people are so keen to credit Unforgiven with. Clint yeah. Eastwood's 1992 Best Picture winner. Um, they called it this great anti-Western, it demystified the West, and, you know, they're using the, the, the vulgar language and the, the, the murder and the blood, and you, you see these terrible people, and, you know, Clint Eastwood was revolutionary when he did this, and, like, it's a weaker version of the Wild Bunch, honestly. Yeah. Um, because as, as brutal as Unforgiven is, the Wild Bunch is about a thousand percent more brutal, and um, it's 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 interesting when when you know that people are only looking at a select slice of of film history uh, that that they don't know going back into some of this stuff that uh that kind of preceded it and even this this was peckinpah's fourth film after the wonderful ride the high country which is also kind of an atypical western that deals with aging starring randolph scott um it's a wonderful picture um then he followed that with uh or I'm sorry, that was his second picture. His first picture was The Deadly Companions. I haven't actually seen that one. Then he did Major Dundee with uh, with uh, uh, what's his name? <laughs> ben Hur, Charlton Heston, uh, which was also kind of uh, that one. That one was kind of taken away from him and recut, and. Uh, the director's cut is much better than the original. The original cut doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, but he was doing this in the early 60s and mid 60s. I think Major Dundee was 65, and it had some of the blood in- effects that he used in the Wild Bunch. Yeah. Um, which I know I, you haven't seen much Peck and Pod. I've seen. I saw this was. The, Two or this three. was the first of his that I saw, so mm. it kind of re- I I wanted to see more. <laughs> I think actually looking down his list, I may have seen a little more than I thought I did because um, I did see okay. Straw Dogs. Uh-huh. I saw this. Um, I, Convoy was the first one. 
Um, which is not a great film, but it's, you can tell, you can see a lot of the Wild Bunch in it. Um, and I saw the Osterman Weekend, which I hated. Um, that was his last film. Yeah, the Osterman Weekend was not good. Um, neither was, uh, what was it, the Iron Cross, I think he did? Never saw that. Cross of Iron. Never saw that. Cross of Iron isn't that good either, and the Killer Elite, I think, is like more of a, it's like a military version of, um... The Wild Bunch, mm-hmm. it's not it's not that good. He also did uh, uh, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid, which um, is notable really only for the fact that Bob Dylan wrote uh, "Knocking on Heaven's Door" for it, right? And actually, and actually appears in it. Um, he also did "Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia," mm-hmm. which is an excellent picture. Yeah. It's that's got that's another one with uh, with Warren Oates. Um, Ballad of Cable Hogue with uh, Jason Robards is also really good. He does a lot of pictures about uh, people who are kind of stuck in their time. Stuck in their time, but also kind of rotten people. Right, yeah. He loves movies about <laughs> rotten people. Almost invariably. Yes, yes, he does. Because I remember Convoy, and... I remember Convoy, there was not a single likable person in that movie. <laughs> and Chris Christopherson was in it, and um, Ali McGraw was in it, and I remember. Oh wow! Not exactly, and Ernest Borgnine. Ernest Borgnine played the villain. Um, if you can imagine, with that film, if you can imagine, Chris Christopherson would have been Burt Reynolds, Ali McGraw would have been Sally Field, and Ernest Borgnine would have been Jackie Gleason. Oh. Uh. If you can imagine that kind of seriousness, now the movie is. Badly dated. I mean, really seriously badly dated. It's not a great film, but it's one of those um, where you feel like you're putting yourself in the hands of a great director. Even though mm-hmm. it's not great work, you're you're watching it and you're thinking, okay, I'll put myself in the hands of his mediocre films better than I will somebody else's best. Sure, yeah, yeah. And he was, he was the type... Um... He would frequently get his movies taken away from him, like like Orson Welles, yeah. um, because he would he would plan and plan and plan and plan and plan and plan until they said no, you have to shoot. So then he would go on location. He would shoot and 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 he would shoot until they said no, you have to stop shooting. You have to come back and cut the picture. And then he would edit until they're like, you know what? This is either done or we're going to cut it ourselves. <laughs> sounds he only a lot lived like for what, while he was making that film. It sounds a lot like what happened to Michael Cimino with Heaven's Gate. Um, yeah. he just kept shooting and kept shooting and kept shooting until he had, you know, 5 6 hours worth of material and then, you know, of course his movie turned Heaven's Gate turned out to be a disaster, but um, it sounds a lot like um, it sounds an awful lot like what what happened there, you know, with and with um, with any Apocalypse films, Apocalypse. Um, yeah. where you and with Apocalypse Now, and, yeah, <laughs> and Apocalypse Now, only those movies, only that movie worked. Um, yeah, it did. Yeah, well, the thing is, um, sometimes, like I say, I'd rather put myself in the hands of a director who's doing his mediocre work rather than a lesser director who's doing his best work. And right. with this, I noticed, and let's talk about the technical aspects here, because mm-hmm. there's a lot of chaos in this film. Um, yes, there, there seems There seems to have been scenes where um, a lot of the editing is, is looks kind of haphazard, although I know that mm-hmm. I know that this film was edited within an inch of its life, um, yes. with careful precision to every shot. So there oh, yeah. are shots, and this does not happen. You notice this does not happen in westerns before this. There are scenes, there are shots that only last about three seconds. Yeah, and at the end, the average shot length is about a second. Yeah. In that final gun sh- gunfight, it's about a second. It's cut up almost as much as the, the shower scene in Psycho. Yeah. Um, he, he did not go for long takes. Um... He also didn't go for an uh, uh, an unobtrusive camera. Mm-hmm. 
there are there are uh, zooms, pans, whips, just blatant moves in and out like fast zooms. Like there there's this one at the end. They shoot Mapache, and Pike, the William Holden character, is bent over, ready to go. He's got his gun, and he's looking around, and nobody starts shooting. Yeah. And he doesn't understand, and and Duke, uh, Borgnine's character, just starts laughing, and then Holden turns and stands up. And in that move, the camera, as he turns, does this quick zoom in. Yeah. So that, and a, and a kind of a pan up. So it kind of follows him as he turns and, and stands up. And he looks at one of the Germans and he's like, let's go. Yeah. And he just shoots. And that, that starts that bloodbath. And that's. It's atypical, first of all, for a Western, and it's really atypical for anything that was put together by a Hollywood studio, because they always wanted the editing and the camera movements were supposed to, you weren't supposed to be conscious of them. Yeah. Um, classical editing techniques are, you're not really supposed to think about it. It's supposed to be match cuts uh, on the person while they're talking. Everything's supposed to make sense. That's not what Peck and Paw does here. It has to be easily digestible to the average moviegoer. Right. There, and... there's not a challenge to anything, and it has to follow from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, and it has to quickly get there. One of the best right. scenes in the movie, for me, that I noticed was the scene where they were robbing the train. Because that scene, I think, is about 25 mm -hmm. minutes long, and most of it is just them getting set up. Also improvised on the day. Also improvised on the day. And they, they were getting set up, and they were trying... The, you just see... Uh, you see Warren Oates on one end of the train. You see uh, mm -hmm. William Holden on the other end of the train. And you just... It's it's this build-up and build-up and build-up and build-up and build-up. Most of this movie is build-up. Yeah. And he will stop to focus on things that another director wouldn't have focused on because most of these scenes are just to speed up to get to the action right cut right to the meat get to the action because that's what the audience wants mm -hmm. but he's not trying to please the audience he's trying to get he's trying to get the point across he's trying to tell a story he's trying, he's trying to tell trying a story to tell a good story and one of the things i noticed is that he focuses on characters that really and truly don't mean anything to the story he focuses on characters right for long periods of time, there's a scene where they go back to, um, was it Mapache's uh, little uh, sort of citadel there, and he sends out oh, well, he sends out this character named I, I believe the character's name is El Guapo, something like played that. Yeah, by yeah. Alfonso Arau, who's a wonderful who's a director by the way. Of uh, uh -huh. he made one of my favorite films ever, uh, Like Water for Chocolate. And, uh, mm -hmm. But his film roles, he always plays this character. Yeah. yeah, he played this same character in Three Amigos and in Romancing the Stone. And he uh -huh. always plays <laughs> yep. this exact same character. And he was like in his 20s at the time. But mm -hmm. he focuses on these characters that are not particularly attractive. Mm -hmm. And these sort of ugly faces and these um, set amid these backgrounds that are almost biblical. Mm -hmm. And um, some of the scenes, uh, some of these characters, you're wondering, what does this have to do with anything? And you'll get just a little bit from the character, and it's just all you need. Yeah. Like, um, this character, you could tell uh, he loves the position that he's in, mm -hmm. but you could see underneath that he's scared to death by what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. There's something uh -huh. else going on inside the character, even though the character is basically a stereotype. Right. Um, so you can read so much into the character. The same thing goes for uh, Freddy's grandson. When we get back to the be yeah. when, when we're at the beginning of the film, is like he's just he loves having a gun in his hand. 
I think his name is Crazy Lee. Yeah, Crazy Lee. It's a character I've, it's, it's an actor I've seen before. Um, but he's, um, it, it's just, like I say, horrible human beings. But at the mm-hmm. same time, you sense a humanity in there. Yeah. And he does the same, I mean, the side characters, it's really impressive what he does with the side characters. And the two that stand out the most in, um, Deke Thornton's group. Yeah. Uh, is, uh, Coffer. Mm-hmm. played by Struther Martin. Yeah. And TC played by LQ Jones. LQ Jones of course was in a lot of Peck and Paw. Um the last thing I remember seeing him in he was in uh, a Prairie Home Companion as the, yeah. the singer that dies backstage. Um he's also the writer director of a weird little uh post-apocalyptic movie called The Boy and His Dog. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Strother Martin we should also mention Strother Martin also we should also mention um, his place in film history uh, was a movie called Cool Hand Luke yes what we got here is a failure to communicate that was his line mm-hmm. that's what he's famous yep. for and he appears in this mm-hmm. film and when you hear his voice you're just waiting for him to, to say that line <laughs> <laughs> and um, I tell you that my favorite character he was also hmm? He was also in Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. He, he was. was the payroll guy that gets shot. And he, every time he, he spits uh, his tobacco, he would either say bingo or damn it, depending on whether he dribbled it or if he got a good shot. <laughs> My favorite character in this movie, though, is the one played by Edmund O'Brien. Um, mm-hmm. Freddie Sykes, who plays almost kind of the Gabby Hayes character. Yeah. Um, but again, you know like El Guapo and like uh, Crazy Lee is a character that in any other western in a John Wayne western would have been written off mm-hmm. and you would have had um, just a couple of lines he would have been just local color and wouldn't have never thought about him um, but he's the only one of the bunch that lives yeah yeah and, and it <laughs> reminded me a lot of Walter Houston in Treasure of the Sierra Madre Exactly. Um, yeah. And he's kind or, uh, of or Walter Brennan right. in um Real Bravo. Yeah. He um he's you don't even recognize him. If you've never seen Edmund O'Brien, he was in a mm. he was a classic, he was a, a studio contract player, he was in uh, DOA and I believe Angels with Dirty Faces, if I'm not mistaken. Um as the yeah. master. He was he was also the uh the voice of Johnny Dollar early in the mid forties on the radio. Yeah uh freelance insurance investigator my favorite radio program i did not know he. (laughs) i did did not even know he was in this movie and i kept looking for him and he you couldn't you can't tell he looks he can't even tell he was usually this dashing cut a dashing figure yeah but this i mean he just looks he looks like an old man he's actually threatens he's under a heavy beard he's um the the leathery skin you can't tell mm-hmm. it's him if you've ever he seen He alters him. his voice so much yeah. too that it's you can't you can't tell it's him. Here's a funny thing also. <laughs> you don't know until halfway through the movie that Crazy Lee is his grandson. Yeah. You just sort of find that out. He's, Any other movie he, he asks how'd my boy do? He's like, oh, he's my, he was my daughter's boy. Mm-hmm. It's like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> he's like, well, he got to earn his way like everybody else. Yeah. yeah, and it's just sort of dropped in there, and I'm like, wait a minute, because I'm used to I'm used to um, the the standard narrative where you would find this information out in the first scene. Mm-hmm. No, you don't find this information out until about ninety minutes into the movie, and some of his actions kind of makes sense at that point right because you're thinking okay freddie sykes is such a wild character and such a weird kind of um Mm -hmm. nutty character that you kind of get it yeah you kind of get it and you you also get crazy lee's dedication then too yeah because when they're when they're in the bank um he says to crazy lee pike says to crazy lee you hold him here when the shooting starts. And he says, I'll hold him till hell freezes over. I'll hold I'll hold him till hell comes in. Or I'll hold him till hell until you, or until you say so. Yeah. It's like, there's this, like, 
fanatical devotion to him, but it's understandable because his grandfather's been working with him for so long. There's um, one little mistake there, one little problem I had with the film. I saw this um, on Blu-ray. Um, mm-hmm. On the direct, it was the director's cut, as I mentioned before. Mm-hmm. One of the things about this film, unfortunately, is that when you get a movie like this on Blu-ray, the colors, you can really see colors and textures and all of that, and it's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. The problem is that in a scene like that, when Crazily is shot, the blood looks orange. (laughs) It looks like paint. So that's the the drawback to having a movie like this on DVD is that you can see, um, you can see some of the seams like that. Um, Mm -hmm. I was just noticing just how how fake the blood looks, (laughs) Um, and it it was that may be to the to the detriment of of um, of Blu-ray. Well, I mean, it looks even when I first saw it on on widescreen VHS on a 13-inch television 18, 19 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> Almost 20 years ago. Uh, you can tell, like, the the blood looks like oil paint. Yeah. And uh, they were doing, uh, again, in that documentary, they said that they, they were doing that, that scene at the end and they didn't have the amount of extras that it looks like they have. Yeah. So they kind of put them on an assembly line. When they got shot, if they would cut or cut back, like they would have the person come off, they would paint over the uniform where the bullet hole was mm-hmm. with tan paint, put another squib in them, and send them out to get shot oh again. <laughs> Efficient filmmaking, you know. Yeah. Um. I, I thought about that. I, I thought um, I, every movie I see, I have to put myself in the context of the times. Not the context of the times that the movie w- uh, takes place in, but the context of the times in which the movie was made. Mm-hmm. Because this, kids, you need to know, um, from about the mid-30s until the late 60s, there was what's called a production code. In, Hayes Code. With a Hayes Code. Well, Hayes Code for a while, and then it turned to the production code, which yeah, yeah, yeah. was a long list of things in movies you were not allowed to do. Mm-hmm. No nudity, no bad language. Um, nope. Uh, married couples had to be in separate beds. You know, all of this stuff. Um, kisses had to be uh, uh, chaste. You, you know. couldn't. Um... Oh, what was it? A- any any time there was a there was a criminal, they had to be either arrested and put in jail or, or killed. killed at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, they 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 had to be punished for their wrongdoing. And that started with Scarface in 1932. They had to meet a grisly fate at some way at some time but there were all of these different things and if you ever watch a movie from the 1950s or early 60s or even the 40s you'll note how um it, it it's completely devoid of any kind of sullen material you might say um yeah gunshots are bloodless gunshots are bloodless when you saw a gunshot and I, I want to recommend that if you watch this movie, watch it coupled with High Noon. Because when, uh, uh, uh. when someone gets shot in High Noon, they grab their stomach and they stumble backwards and they fall down. Uh-huh. When, this, when someone gets shot in this movie, their chest explodes. Yeah, pretty There's much. There's a messy, bloody, gory mess. And it shoot, it also, shoots out, and yeah. there's exit wounds, and people get their throats cut. That never uh-huh. happened. Um, so. Maybe the closest thing you ever got was someone got scalped. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, but you never saw it. Right. So when you get to the late '60s, the, produ- the production code breaks down. Popular tastes, you know, people want different things. 
the youth audience has changed. They they don't want certain things. They they want something different. And all of that, um, the production code breaks down. And in comes the new Hollywood. And they want to try new things. They want to um, feel their way, as it were. And that's right. when you get movies like this. That's mm-hmm. when you get movies like Easy Rider. That's when you get mm-hmm. movies like Midnight Cowboy. Mm-hmm. That's when you get later, when you get movies like The Exorcist and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and you get Taxi you know, Driver. Taxi and... Driver. You know, you get the new Hollywood, the darker subject matter that Hollywood mm-hmm. would never have allowed in the old mm-hmm. days. And you get a movie like this, which demystifies the West. It takes the protagonist, makes him the antagonist, and, you know, the, the roles are muddled. Yeah. So, you know, you get something a little ambiguous. Yeah. As far as the heroic because role, you're you're rooting for people who are basically the bad guys. They're stealing from a train company. They're stealing payroll from a town they're stealing uh weapons from the united states government to give it to a corrupt bandit who calls himself a general to sow unrest further unrest and and disharmony and misery and pain in mexico uh during their civil war and you're rooting against the outlaw turned law enforcement basically mm-hmm. good guy and his band you're you're rooting against the people that would have been the good guys in a move in a western five years previous you would have been following the robert ryan character yeah you would have been following the good guys following the bad guys the bad guys would have been killed in a shootout or or taken to jail mm-hmm. and that would have been the end of it Mm-hmm. But it wouldn't have been this. This movie is very innovative. Yes. Like I say, I put it. I put it in the times in which it was made, um, when the world was very violent, and the world was ready for a movie like this because this was during the high, st- uh, Vietnam was still burning. Mm-hmm. Um, the civil rights, the um, the civil rights movement was essentially over, and you were just now feeling the the negative effects of it. Mm-hmm. So the world was violent. Yeah. And yet it also takes place at a time when the world was becoming more violent. Mm -hmm. So you get all of that and you recognize what the what the movie is is trying to say. That it's not This this was released in July of nineteen sixty nine, uh something like a month after Bobby Kennedy was killed. Yeah. And maybe two months after JFK was killed, like or not JFK, uh, Martin Luther Martin King. Martin Luther King. I got the K yeah. right. Uh, and, um, <laughs> so anybody going to see this movie would have said, yeah, I get it. Anybody on the yeah. right wavelength. Mm-hmm. It's, it's not escapism. It's a co- it's commentary. Yeah. It says something about the world we were living in at the time. And um, I, I'm really, I'm impressed by it. I really yeah. am very impressed by it. I'm watching it. I, I plan to see it again. Um, because I get the feeling that this is a movie that I will start thinking about um, even after you and I have stopped even after you and I have stopped talking about it I will still be thinking about it oh yeah this this movie doesn't really leave your consciousness um, like I said I've been I first saw this about 19 years ago and I still revisit it uh, as much as possible I've, I've watched it probably 25 times within like 5 years I would just yeah. always go back to it, um, and it, it, it's it's something that when you when you first see it, you're you're captivated by the the visceral qualities of it, juxtaposed by these older men mm-hmm. who you know say they don't want to do this anymore. But there's that one scene where uh, uh, it was after the washer incident, and uh, Pike's talking to Duke, and he's like, you know, this was going to be it for me. 
and he goes, "Really?" He's he's basically saying like, "You don't know anything else. Do you really think that this was going to be the end for you? Like, do you have anything lined up? Did you think of anything that you were going to do with this money to 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 settle down?" Like, yeah, and also you have to. This movie really tells you a lot of what's going on in the characters' heads in a way that other westerns don't. Because you're mm-hmm. thinking to yourself, okay, you, you even if they had gotten the silver, well, now what? Right. Where are you gonna go? What are you gonna do? Because and they're the still thing, being hunted. Right. Because you know, eventually, you know, you got the gold, you got the silver, but that's not the end of it. Right. You you're not safe yet. Mhm. And I you know I and then they go south to Mexico I guess to to find some some measure of safety and only to realize that Mexico is not safe. No. Um Mexico is a hotbed of political tension. Mm-hmm. And this revolution that Pancho Villa is is ex- exacerbating. Mm-hmm. And also you know, it's just the the world is just too dangerous for something this simple, right? You know, and one thing I I, I noticed, one thing I loved about that scene where they were talking about, you know, when they discover the silver washers, that scene goes on and on and on, mm-hmm. where they're just sitting there and they're talking about it and they're laughing about it and they're joking about it, but then they start thinking about it, mm-hmm. and it it's it's kind of amazing that the that the film would do that because most films. You would find the washers, they would scream at each other, and then that would be the end of it. Right. But that scene ends with them laughing. Yeah. Because, uh, what is it, he, he was yelling at the Gorge Brothers because, um, they said, we spent all of our money setting this up. And he goes, you spent all your money running whores and in, in this town, and I spent all of my stake in setting this up. Yeah. And then he kind of looks around and he picks up the washers and he throws them down and he goes, hell, I should have been running whores. And yeah. then they just all start laughing. <laughs> that's when Warren, That's when William Holden stops everything when he says, we got to start thinking beyond our guns. Yeah. We got to start thinking about what we're going to do when the shooting stops because mm-hmm. eventually, you know, we're never, they're never going to have a moment. Even mm-hmm. if they get away with this, they're never going to have a moment when they're going to be able to be comfortable. Um, because he never thought beyond, nobody ever really thought beyond the money. It's like they don't really have mm-hmm. a plan. Right. And, you know, you're still going to have to look over your shoulder for the rest of your life. Mm-hmm. Um, even if you dispatch with the gang that's that's chasing you, somebody will always be behind them. Mm-hmm. So it really becomes this this nice commentary about the nature of the criminal lifestyle. Um, there's never an end to it. Well, there is right. one end to it, and that's but you you can't live with it. Mm-hmm. Um, no. It's like the movie Goodfellas. I thought of the movie Goodfellas mm-hmm. a lot during this movie because I thought, yeah, you can rob trucks and you can do all of this stuff, but eventually there's a toll to be paid for this. Mm-hmm. And I think this movie makes that very clear. There is a toll to be paid eventually. This was uh, this was very influential to Scorsese, actually. He, Jay Cox, who was a critic at the time, is his friend, uh, took him to a screening room uh, at Warner Brothers to to screen this. It was Scorsese, Jay Cox, two other critics, and I think like two other people in the room at a Warner Brothers screening room. Mm -hmm. And they were just... Scorsese was just in awe of it. Just... Yeah. He's like, this this is a masterpiece. As soon as as it was over, they were like... They couldn't believe what they'd see. Mm -hmm. Because no one had ever done anything like this. We talked about this last time, and I'm sure this is something that Scorsese noticed. We talked about this last time when we talked about Woody Allen's films. Um... We talked about the average shot length, mm-hmm. the ASL, and how long certain shots are allowed to go. And I'm wondering if that's what influenced him, because I noticed that a lot in, Sc- in Scorsese's work is that some shots are allowed to linger a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. 
because we talked about Woody Allen and how long he allows scenes to gestate, shots to gestate, because there's dialogue right. that can be worked in. And mm -hmm. the same thing goes here. Yeah. Because there are long, lingering shots in just letting people talk. Mm -hmm. Letting the actors have room to breathe. Well, I know that um, for a while in the 60s, there was kind of a a trade-off influence between Sergio Leone and Sam Peckinpah. Um, you can see Peckinpah's influence in the first Dollars film. Yeah. And you can see Leone's influence in Major Dundee. Uh, you can you can see like Ride the High Country's influence on on Fistful of Dollars, and uh, Major Dundee was influenced by that, which was then influenced a few dollars more. And then uh, also in what was it sixty seven when uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly came out. And 66. this was just that in 66, that was the, this, this film is the next logical progression in how Westerns were turning from the spaghetti Westerns that Leone was putting out into what Americans could do with that kind of a, the visual representation of their own history. At this moment, John Wayne's vision of the old West was dead. Oh, very much so. John Wayne's westerns died with True Grit. Well, and... did you ever notice um, with the with the John Wayne movies, the westerns, John Wayne westerns, that he started off in 1939 in Stagecoach. Well, he started off before that, but that was his big big role. Um, what was it, the Frisco Kid? And he was kind of an outlaw, right? Mm -hmm. For years, he kind of played the 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 person that went against the grain he yeah. fought against the the ranchers he fought against all these people and then in the 40s 50s and 60s he turned starting around red river in 48 which is a great mm -hmm. picture it is. um he became the rancher mm -hmm. he ended up playing chisholm which was a character that he fought against in one of his earlier pictures in the early 40s. So there's this switch from rebel to establishment, which is exactly what happened with Wayne. Yeah. He was this outsider who became the establishment, and so were all of his pictures. And uh, it's really interesting. And then he took on something like Rooster Cogburn, who was supposed to go back to his more rowdy kind of days and and, and it's less... a terrible picture the rooster it really Cogburn, kind of is yeah the true grit i like the the rooster cock is a terrible movie um one of the things about john wayne and then this is as interesting is that he hated the wild bunch so much because of because of its demystifying the west and because of its violence mm -hmm. but yet well... Yet, he also played a character who would have fit right into this movie. Oh, yeah. In The Searchers. In The Searchers. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And that character, that Ethan character, would have fit perfectly into this. He would, have, he would have been ambiguity. best friends with Pike. <laughs> yeah, that moral ambiguity. So I wonder if this movie wasn't influenced a lot by The Searchers. Because I wouldn't the searchers be didn't want to, de to demystify the hero, the idea, the oh yeah, um, yeah. the the so I wonder about Wayne's comment. Well, it's really it, that that's interesting too that he hated that he hated this. That um, he also hated High Noon. Yeah, he and Howard Hawks hated High Noon so much because it was Gary Cooper asking for help. Mm -hmm. they hated it so much that they made Rio Bravo where all the townspeople yeah. are offering to help and he refuses them saying no you're civilians you don't need to be wrapped up in this okay and, yeah. And yeah that was actually a response to to high noon and there are people who there are those in in our circles that will say 
you either like High Noon or you like Rio Bravo. I love both yeah. of them. <laughs> well, I'm going to go even further because I'm going to say this. You could say that at the end of the 60s, this movie helped to kill the Hollywood Western. Yes. I don't think it did. No? I think the movie that killed the Hollywood Western was Blazing Saddles. <laughs> because if this movie oh, yeah. ripped the lid off and made it a reality, Blazing Saddles ripped the lid off and showed you how ridiculous the Hollywood Western yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. to be honest with you, <laughs> it's never been the same after Mel Brooks. No. Um, because as <laughs> as sticky as that movie is racially, um, I, I have to say, and I, I I will defend this movie to to my, to my dying day. I oh, still think too. it's a brilliant film. Oh, it is. It's a, it absolutely is. It's my wife's favorite movie. I love that movie to death, and it's um, th th I think that movie did more to end the western than this one did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably true because not only not only like you talked about the horses getting injured, and as soon as as soon as you mentioned like some of the horses get shot here, they fall over and stuff. I'm like, that's nothing compared to Mongo punching one in the face. Yeah. Alex Karras walks up and just punches the horse in the face and it falls over. Which I still don't know how they did that effect. I really don't. <laughs> and to be honest with you, I thought about that. While there were, there's a scene early in the movie when um, there's a guy who falls off his horse in the in the Wild Bunch. There's a guy who falls off his horse and mm -hmm. gets drugged behind it. And all I could think of was that scene in Blazing Saddles where the guy gets drugged behind the horse and all you hear is, well, that's the end of this suit. Yeah. <laughs> so. the, yeah. the the thing that i did want to bring up um kind of going back out, outside of its influence and going back into kind of its visual poetry there's a symmetry to the movie i don't know if you yeah. saw this when you were when you were when you were watching it but at the beginning during the opening credits it's very very much it's at the very beginning uh the bunch are, are coming into this this town where they're going to rob the payroll, and it freezes on the people and has their names. And it goes black and white. Right, it goes into black and white, but then it comes back and it's you see them coming in, but they're watching these local kids, and this is something that yes. they discovered when they were on set that yeah. this is this was like a thing that they did. They took scorpions and put them into an ant mm -hmm. hive. Mm -hmm. And the scorpions would try their best, and they they could take out a bunch of ants, but the ants always overwhelmed them. And then at the end, they put in burning fronds and burned yeah. all of them. I was going to mention this scene. It is because... an absolute allegorical parallel to the mm -hmm. end of the movie. Right. I was going to mention this scene because it, it speaks so much to um, what you see for the rest of the films. These guys mm -hmm. who are... Um, these guys who are criminals mm -hmm. and they've gotten themselves in a trap that they will never get out of right they're the scorpions they're the scorpions everybody else Nor is the ants everyone around right. them right and, and normally, they're being swallowed up yep yeah, normally feared and deadly but when you're just overwhelmed by superior numbers your, your stinger and your claws can only do so much Right, right. Um, I I'm glad you introduced me to this movie. I'm glad you <laughs> prompted me to see this. Um, I love films like this. I love films that have me thinking. They challenge me. They don't. Yeah. I hate a director that doesn't respect my intelligence. Um, and Sam Peck and Paul definitely does. He. Oh um, yes. The the very few films that I've seen him, I've really enjoyed, except for the probably the last film he did. Uh, wow, the Osterman yeah. Weekend, which felt to me very much like Studio Meddling. Studio Meddling, uh, he was very slowly dying of alcoholism. Uh, yeah. Very slowly. I think he died in 84. Died in, and, yeah, uh, he died, yeah, he died in 84, the year after the Osterman Weekend came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and he was... And, his his alcoholism was a problem on pretty much all of his sets from 
Major Dundee in 65 until the Osterman weekend in 83. It may have so. been... It may have had a lot to do... I, I don't know that as much about Sam Peck and Paul. It may have had a lot to do with um, his experiences during the war. He was a mm -hmm. Marine. Yeah. And a lot of his experience may have worked its way into his work because his work mm -hmm. is almost always violent. Yes. But it's not playful violence at no. all. No. And he was, he was a very, he was a very hard living, hard man. Uh, yeah. he was, he was in, he was in the vein, um, he was younger then, but in the vein of, uh, the old style adventure, uh, uh, directors like John Huston and Ralph Walsh and, uh, yeah. Marion C. Cooper and, uh, all the people that put their life on their line, they put their art into their life and the, the art on screen was stunning but their their lives were even more tale filled and uh he was kind of one of the last of that breed even though john houston outlived peck and paw by about three years I mean, he died yeah. in 87 um that that kind of rough and tumble i'm gonna get into an adventure i'm gonna drink all night while i write and mm -hmm. you know that that he was one of the last of those yeah. um and it should be noted that uh this movie was nominated for two academy awards mm -hmm. uh best original sadly score not best sadly not but score and uh best original story and screenplay right um to the best of my knowledge this is peck and paul's only oscar nomination yeah um which is sad. And it's, it's too bad because all of his films that I've seen have been, even if they're not great films, because honestly, uh, the other two that I saw, Straw Dogs and the Osterman Weekend, were not great. I but again, you sense that there I would, was. I would debate you on Straw Dogs, but it's been a long time since I've seen it. Straw uh, Dogs is just unpleasant <laughs> to me. It's, it is, it's just really but I think it's wonderful. His other ones, Pat Garrett and Billy the Kid isn't the, that good. Like I said, it's best known because uh, Knocking on Heaven's Door comes from it. But uh, it's well acted. It's basically like The Wild Bunch, but it's just between two people. It's like if, if Pike was just by himself. Mm -hmm. And because the, um, Pat Garrett was Billy the Kid's friend, and then he became a sheriff, and then he started to hunt him. It's basically yeah. the same concept a very different movie um the director's cut of that is also much better than the original version mm -hmm. um but both aren't that spectacular uh but something like uh the getaway was a lot of fun junior bond yeah i forgot about the getaway that was uh yeah. the one with steve mcqueen yeah 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 um that was really really good i really like that movie a lot mm -hmm. i'd forgotten about that one Mm -hmm. I'd, I'd, I'd seen it, but I had forgotten it was a Peck and Paw movie. Yep. Um, it was the standard old. Um, basically, that's what it is. It's a getaway. You know? Yeah. And it's, it's car chase movie. And, and um, it's great. Ally McGraw and they're, yeah, it's uh -huh. wonderful. <laughs> um, it was remade as a terrible movie. With, what was um, it? Ninety four. Yeah, yeah. It was a terrible movie, and that was Isn't that Emilio uh, Estevez. No. No, you're thinking of Wisdom. Um, uh, no, that was, uh, was it Richard Gere, I think? Richard and, Gere was um, it Charlie Sheen? Was it Charlie Sheen? No, um, that was a movie called The That's Chase. That's a different, yeah, that was This was Chase. a movie with Richard Gere and, uh, Kim Basinger. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was yeah, just yeah. awful. It was just terrible. 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 Um, and so was the remake of Straw Dogs. I didn't um, bother with it. Um, I, 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 I saw Straw Dogs once. Um, I actually, I own it. I haven't rewatched it, but it's, I would say I would recommend that if we're going to move into our recommendations, which yeah. I think we probably should. Um, I would actually recommend, uh, a, a handful of Peck and Paw movies to kind of, uh, see after this, um, yeah. ride the high country, um, is definitely one of them with Randolph Scott. It's a brilliant, it's, it's, it's got the same kind of theme, aging cowboys, kind of being being aged out of yeah. of their life um wonderful wonderful picture uh 
The Ballad of Cable Hogue with Jason Robards um, is another great Peck and Paw picture that uh, that people kind of forget about. Uh, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia, which I didn't know about until Roger Ebert put it in his great movies. Um, and yeah, I, and this, I saw he it with the Wild Bunch in his great. He movies did too. put the Wild Bunch in the great movies too. Uh, Bring Me the Head of Alfredo Garcia is a bizarre, bizarre movie. That, I've never seen uh, that. One. Oh, it's weird. It's very, very weird. Uh, I would recommend that. But even, uh, I would say, if if you're going to watch this and you want something to kind of butt up against it that's not peck and paw, rewatch or watch for the first time Unforgiven to see yeah. what what this does versus what that does and why this is, in my opinion anyway, a superior picture. Um, this movie you informs. Could... I'll say this: this movie, Will Wild Bunch, informs a lot of the movies that would come along in the next decade. Oh, absolutely, and beyond. Um, if I'm going to recommend anything, I'm going to say uh, double features. Mm-hmm. Watch the Wild Bunch coupled with High Noon. Yeah, because you'll see a movie that is very un Hollywood in the Wild Bunch, and a very movie that is very Hollywood in High Noon. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, the other one I want to recommend is uh, another Peck and Paw movie. It's not great, but I'm going to recommend Convoy. Um, because I want people to understand, and I want people to watch it uh, on a double bill with Smoking the Bandit. Because mm-hmm. you'll see mm-hmm. what Peck and Paw was all about in right. trying to overturn a Hollywood convention. Mm-hmm. Um, if you took Smoking the Bandit and you put it in the real world, it would look like right. Convoy. It's, <laughs> like I say, it's not a great movie. Right. But check it out anyway. Because you'll see something unusual. If right. you, especially if you watch it with any number of the Hal Needham pictures. Yes. Um, but that's those are my recommendations. Yeah, and I I think that uh, I think that about wraps it up for us, Jerry. Where can we find you on the World Wide Web internets? You can find me on them internets at uh, <laughs> armchaircinema.com and also armchairoscars.com. Uh, next week is my selection. Mm-hmm. We're going from we're, we're going from the old west to the streets of Scotland. Uh, for a very, very bizarre journey. Uh, <laughs> Scarlett Johansson yes. stars as an alien stealing men's skins in a movie called Under the Skin. Excellent movie. Uh, and I'm Doug Heller. You can find me at TalkMovieToMe.com. I'm on Twitter at Basement Noise and at TalkMovieToMe1. And uh, I think that about wraps it up for us. As always, give us your likes, your comments. If you want us to cover a movie that that you adore uh, and you want to hear us talk about it, let us know in the comments. Let us know what you think, how we're doing uh, on this and on our other podcast, The Cave of Wonders, where we cover Disney pictures. Um, And... uh, that uh, I think that about does it for us here. Thank you very much for listening. And the pod bay doors are now closed. Mission has been completed.